Assalamu alaikum. Soon the followers is excited to bring to our viewers another treat that will awaken, clarify, and widen our understanding of this beautiful way of life. We are excited to welcome Dr. Daniel Abdul Rahman McBride, who will be joining us each Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern for a special class geared to the new Shahadas in facing contemporary issues of today. Dr. Daniel Abdul Rahman McBride is a renowned author of many books, including Who is Right, Who is Wrong, and Why, which is a comparison of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. He has been featured on many popular programs as he breaks down Islam to the viewers from a lens of clarity. Stay tuned. Streaming on major platforms, channel Sunnah followers. Always an honor to listen to Dr. Abdul Rahman Dani McBride. And Jazakallah khair for everything. And you still give us one hour every week, and Jazakallah khair for that. Now, brother and sister, whoever listening in social media, not only in Facebook, I know in Instagram and YouTube and many, please you have to share this uh, talk. It's very important, please, brother and sister. Jazakallah khair. Dr. McBride, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. What I'd like to do is finish up the chapter. The biblical Paul versus the biblical God and the biblical Jesus. But I would also like to remind us, if I can start this talk today with one of the quotes of, uh, of the biblical Paul in describing where he got his information from. If y'all remember last week, Paul gave us three different conversion stories of his own. There were also two other versions given by followers of Paul. So we've got a little confusion there. But the most important quote, I think, was literally where Paul writes a letter to the Corinthians, and it's supposed to be the second letter. So it's 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 7. I'd like to remind us all who one of Paul's after his conversion or, and probably before, Allah knows best. One of his constant companions was... Um, excuse me, which page are you beginning in? Oh, I'm sorry. What we're going to, I'm jumping back just to remind us who Paul was. We will okay. start, we will start on page 68. The page I'm actually looking at right now, if you'd like to, I can wait a sec. Is page 62 and 63. Sorry about that. I just I just like to remind us, everyone, if you weren't here last week, page 63 clearly describes who one of his close companions was. This is Paul writing in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 7. I knew a man in Christ above or approximately 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. And I know I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How? that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So he's saying he was associated with someone who heard things that he could not repeat. And then he finishes this with, and lest I should be exalted above measure, his pride takes over, picture this, above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh the mess messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So in Paul, in his own words, on page 62 and 63, in his own words, he says he doesn't know where his revelations came from, but he knows that the messenger of Satan was with him to keep him humble. That is 
his verified companion. Because remember earlier in this, this chapter, he also mentioned all these conversion stories where he fell off the horse. He saw a light. He heard the voices. The people with him saw the light. They didn't hear any voices. The people with him heard the voices but didn't see the light. And then another version, in his words, everyone fell off the horses because they saw the light and heard the voices. So this is Paul, the biggest proselytizer, or the biggest voice that is quoted in Christianity today. All the Corinthians, the Acts, the Thessalonians, all these letters, these are Paul's words, not the biblical Jesus and biblical God. Now, if we could jump back over to page 68 and 69, that was Paul's background. And while you go there on page 68, since we know what the biblical Jesus message was, do we have any information as to who his message was intended for? And remember, we covered this a couple chapters ago, but I'd like to remind us, because this is a huge conflict between the biblical Jesus and the biblical Paul. Who his message was intended for. In the following verses, the biblical Jesus tells us he came for the Jews who had gone astray. He reinforces this with the directive to his disciples not to teach the Gentiles or the non-Jews. And remember, in Paul's self-description, he said he was persecuting and killing and, and, and putting in prison. He was going to the synagogues to get these people. And at when in the chapter about the crucifixion, one of the last stories says it ends with the disciples were in the synagogues praying all the time after. Jesus ascension. So here you've got Jesus saying, the biblical Jesus tells us he was here for the Jews. You've got Paul saying he was going to the synagogues to get the believers and followers of Jesus. And again, Jesus himself says he was not there to change any laws. He wasn't there to change anything. So we've got what we see today. We've got Jews for Jesus, right? <clears throat> because his message was here to bring the strayed back to the right path. And Jesus, the biblical Jesus in Matthew 10, verses 5 and 6, these 12, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, This is Jesus sent forth, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. If you remember the story in the next verse, in Matthew 15, 22 to 28, where a woman comes and asks the biblical Jesus to free her daughter from the demons, a Canaanite woman. But he answered, after she begged him, but he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then we've got Mark 7, 25 to 29. We'll just go over verse 27. For a certain woman, the woman was a Greek. But Jesus said unto her, let the children first be filled. But, excuse me, for it is not meat or not proper to take the children's bread and cast it unto the dogs. In Matthew 10, Jesus directs his disciples to teach only Jews. In Matthew 15 and Mark 7, Jesus states his mercy and message is only for the lost house of the, for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Jews. With these verses, with these verses, we see that Jesus' message, the biblical Jesus message, was for a lost Israel. And remember, the disciples after his ascension were constantly in the synagogues and temples praying. Where does Paul say he was going to hunt the early Jews for Jesus? In the synagogues. Compare this to Paul in the following verse. Romans, another letter, Romans 10, verses 12 to 13. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that come upon him. For whosoever calleth shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And again, that's that faith without action stuff. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. 
But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Again, he gets this message. He's got a messenger from Satan traveling with him. Jesus just, the biblical Jesus just told us his word, his message is only for the lost house of the sheep of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And now here Paul says that I might preach him among the heathen. In Galatians 3 is the rationale. If you want to read the Galatians 3, literally in its entirety, it's his rationale for faith alone and the message for the Gentiles, especially the Greeks. If you want to take the time, I don't recommend it. I'd recommend reading the Quran more, um, but that's what Galatians 3, his letter to the Galatians is all about uh, faith alone and delivering a message, especially for the Greeks, some of his favorite people. Now, what I'd like to do is directly compare these verses you can see there of the biblical God and Jesus versus Paul. And let's start with righteousness. The biblical God and the biblical Jesus in Genesis 7.1 tells us Noah is righteous. In Genesis 17.1, Abraham is righteous. In Job 1.1.8 1, 1, and 2.3, Job was described as righteous. Amos in 5.16 describes a writer and, and possible prophet. Amos 5.16, some men are righteous. And in Luke, New Testament stuff, 1.6, Zechariah and Elizabeth, a female, are righteous. Paul actually tells us none are righteous. He tells us in, in Romans 3.10 and 1 John uh, verses 1, 8 through 10. He says none are righteous. What else does the Bible tell us that Paul disagrees with? This is the disciple, the self-proclaimed disciple. The following comparisons give us a quick answer to that. As we can see, Paul feels there are no good men or women. God, through the Old Testament authors, and Jesus, through the New Testament authors, give us many examples of righteous predecessors. More importantly, and a key point to Christianity, is the following comparison. Again, we find in the Bible, God and Jesus, the Old Testament and New Testament teachings, they teach one thing and Paul and his message in clear opposition to this same idea, inherited sin. The biblical God through the Old Testament authors, and Jesus through the New Testament authors. Deuteronomy 24.16, the biblical God tells us there is no inherited sin. 2 Chronicles 7.14, there is no inherited sin. Psalms 32.5, no inherited sin. Isaiah 43.25 and 55.7, two different chapters, no inherited sin. Jeremiah 31.29 to 30, no inherited sin. Ex uh, excuse me, Ezekiel 18, 1 through 9, 19, 20, and verse 30 all say there is no such thing as inherited sin, sin, meaning you do not carry the burden of your fathers, of your mothers, of your grandfathers, of your ascendants. Micah 7, 18, one of the Deuteronomy and Micah and Isaiah, three of the best references right there if y'all wanted to actually read what the verses say. That's what the stars mean. Phenomenal verses specifically saying there's no such thing as carrying someone else's burden, no inherited sin. Mark, excuse me, Matthew in 1914, New Testament stuff, Paul later. Matthew 1914, Mark 10, 14, Luke 18, 16. All three of these New Testament authors say there is no such thing as inherited sin. And these according to Christians, are the literal followers of the biblical Jesus. And then we've got Paul, who never met him except when he fell off his horse, when he had the vision. Paul in Romans says there's inherited sin in 328, 4, 2, and 5, 12 to 21, nine verses supporting inherited sin. 
and also in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 56. And that's, again, in Paul's words specifically, 5, uh, Romans 5, 12 to 21, and 1 Corinthians 15, 56. Paul clearly says, going against the Old Testament authors, going against the New Testament authors, Paul in complete disagreement with the biblical God and the biblical Jesus. And this is who most of these pastors and these, these what's the word for it? Um, really enthusiastic believers, they will quote Paul in a fast minute. You see on the back of cars, you see all the Galatians, the Corinthians, all this stuff quoting Paul. If you really, again, of which as Muslims, we know better, but if you really, really, really believe Jesus is a direct son of God, meaning somehow genetically, a part of God on earth, whatever the, that corrupt view is, why wouldn't you just quote the biblical version that has Jesus' words in red? You don't quote Jesus. You don't go with the idea that he only came for the lost house of Israel. You, you've got this weird inherited sin thing. Jesus was all about actions, not just words. Jesus as a prophet, and he described the Jews as prophet killers. He still delivered God's message. That's putting actions, or excuse me, words into actions. Went into the temple. One of the famous stories most people, Muslims and non-Muslims know, is Jesus tipping over the, the, the tables because of the money lenders and all the usury that the Old Testament says the Jews can't use against each other, all the usury that was going on. Jesus clearly demonstrated, the biblical Jesus, clearly demonstrated to the biblical readers that it's all about actions, not just words. Paul is going by faith alone, just believe. And the inherited sin. Now, on page 70, here we have clear evidence from the Old and New Testament, which tell us Individuals are not held responsible for another's sins, but Paul tells us otherwise. Who are we to believe? Do we believe the biblical God in Jesus from the Bible, or do we believe from the same book, Paul, the self-appointed, self-taught, never met Jesus, or learned from his disciples, his apostles' disciple? Remember, on most of his versions, only one does he say he went to Damascus, met with some disciples, and then Barnabas took him to Jerusalem to 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 stand up for him and then he joined them in jerusalem and preached outside the temples to those that come and go um before the versions he said he never studied with anyone and remember in one version he actually said he went to arabia because so remember the book of isaiah in particular tells us that the message will then come out of arabia but here's paul self-appointed self-taught and only met jesus out in the desert when he fell off his horse before answering the question of who are we supposed to believe, we have more information from the Bible to examine. Next, we have the verse where Paul separates Jesus' message, the biblical Jesus, from Judaism. And again, where is it? Galatians on the back of cars. Galatians 1, verses 11 to 16. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not of man. For I neither received it of man, none of Jesus' disciples taught him, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the brethren, and I jump to verse 16, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Like the sister said last week, kind of sounds like the Mormon book being found under the apple tree in upstate New York. Um, but again, he says, for I neither received it of man, neither, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Then we jump a few verses, speaking about God to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Paul also encourages some very, very, very unique ideas, as we can see in the following verses. Paul taught celibacy. 1 Corinthians 7.1, also verses 6 through 8, 
And also, verses 37 and 38, does he say this? Verse 1, now concerning the things whereof ye wrote me, he's answering, wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Hopefully he's speaking about celibacy. Verses 6, 7, and 8, but I speak this by permission and not commandment. I don't know the permission part. For I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Verse 37, 38, nonetheless, same chapter, 1 Corinthians 7, nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power ever, excuse me, power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. So the implications here and, and the books, the Christian scholars imagine. So this indicates this uh, as a side note, and it comes up in other versions as an implication. Here, Paul is insinuating that literally, and he does a little more directly in other verses, that he expected, he was one of the Jews, there's two different tracks in early Judaism where some thought that the messenger, uh, uh, the final prophet would lead them against the Romans, the whole Armageddon thing that Christians that are living here in America, I learned so much about. Um, and of course, the final battle that we know will be coming with Jesus as our leader. A lot of the Jews at Paul's time felt that because Jesus didn't lead them in this final revolution, in this final days of judgment thing, that's why, that's one of the reasons that they went against Jesus. In Paul's case, he really, he was one of those guys that said, yes, it will happen in my lifetime. And this information right here, preaching um, abstinence, supports his idea that there's no sense procreating and avoiding the flesh stuff and, and going after only worship. Of course, if Paul's viewpoint would have won out, <laughs> None of his followers <laughs> would have been here today, right? Um, but yeah, that's and that shows how wrong he is, and that'll come up later also. Of course, many of us are glad that not all of Paul's message is adhered to by today's Christians. Next, Paul again warns the reader of the Bible against his own message. As we see the following verses, as Paul describes liars and hypocrites who do devil's work. And this is what I was just referencing about why Paul shouldn't be believed. Now the spirit in 1 Tim Timothy 4, 1 through 3, verses 1 through 3, on pages 70 and 71, now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart, and that's all the movies, but some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with the hot uh, with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Okay, so he says the hypocrites, this is this is Paul saying that the hypocrites, right? They will be speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscious conscience seared with a hot iron. Very next verse he says, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. What did we just read? Paul is saying you should stay celibate. And what did he just say? Don't give your daughters in marriage. And if you have already, well, that's okay, but you shouldn't, right? Then here, we jump from 1 Corinthians to 1 Timothy, and he says anyone that's preaching or forbidding marriage is a hypocrite and commanding to abstain from meats which God has created 
to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So he says, you're a hypocrite if you forbid to marry, and you're a hypocrite if you're a vegetarian. But the only one he gets upset with <laughs> and says that God ordained it was eating meat, right? When reading these and following verses in 1 Timothy 4, it is possible. It is possible that Paul is telling us that the Spirit is cursing vegetarians more than liars and hypocrites who preach celibacy. Think about it. He criticized the not the 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 non meat eaters more aggressively than he did forbidding marriage and being celibate. With all of this above information against Paul and his message, let us examine what he says about himself again and how he fits into other biblical descriptions and prophecies. Here, Paul is a false prophet. He describes himself, I make myself a transgressor. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Deuteronomy 18, 12, God, the biblical God, describes the false prophet. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord had, Lord had not spoken. The prophet spoke by himself, made it up. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. You shouldn't fear the false prophet. In the book of Daniel, God describes a false prophet again, and he shall speak great words against the Most High. Paul contradicted God over and over again, the biblical God. He contradicted the biblical Jesus over and over again. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the, no, I'm sorry, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing time. So then they'll be cursed and everything. When the end of time comes, they'll be judged. Matthew, and now we move into the New Testament where Jesus describes false prophets. Matthew, the books, uh, book seven, uh, chapter seven, verses 15 to 23. The biblical Jesus warns the biblical readers, beware of the false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Then we'll jump to 19 because he describes them more and more like that. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So he's saying these false prophets are going to be thrown into the hellfire. Wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And I know as Muslims, we don't like the term my Father. Um, if we could look past that and show that Jesus, the biblical Jesus, is separating himself from God. God's in heaven. He's here talking to his audience. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name uh, done many wonderful works. And this is Jesus. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's why we have earlier in this chapter, the comparisons. Paul is in constant contradiction with Jesus. This description in Matthew 7, verses 15 to 23, here he is, pretend this is Paul saying this. And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then Jesus says, the biblical Jesus, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And then on page 72, Matthew 24, verse 24. For then, excuse me, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. And we know that with the Dajjal, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect or, or people that really, really believe. False prophets' prophecies are unfulfilled. And you can reference Deuteronomy 18.22. If the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. Here's Paul in 1 Thessalonians that didn't happen. 
For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. This is Paul writing a letter saying that the word of, this is God's word delivered through Paul, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a throne, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, of the dead believers. Then we which are alive and remain um, shall be caught up together. So he says this is going to happen in his lifetime. With them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Remember, he's saying, Paul is a believer that this stuff is going to happen in his lifetime. He's teaching that it's going to happen in his lifetime. Paul died. If there really was a Paul, Paul died, and it still hasn't happened. Deuteronomy 22, let me remind you, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. False prophets show great signs and wonders, and they deceive the elect, right? There came a viper out of the heat. This is Acts, Paul's stuff, 28, 3 through 10, and fastened on his hand. So this fire jumped, this snake jumped out of the fire and bit him in verse 3. And in verse 5, he shook the beast off into the fire and felt no harm. To whom Paul had entered, oh, I'm sorry. And then he jumps into 8, and he's going to jump in and save somebody. To whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island, came and were healed. False prophets bring evil fruits, right? Faith without, uh, and then we've got Romans 3, 26, 28. We've got faith without law, verses 7, and the false fruits meaning false message or evil fruits. Paul in Romans 7, 6, the law is dead. In 1 Corinthians, circumcision means nothing. Galatians 2.16, a man is not justified by the works of the law. So he's against the law still. Galatians 2.21, righteousness comes from the law, then Christ died in vain. He's still against the law. Jesus said he didn't came to come to change the law. Galatians 3.10, under the law of God, you living under a curse. 3.13, the law is a curse. Galatians 5, rationalization for faith alone. Hebrews, the whole chapter. Hebrews 8.13. God's covenant is old, decaying, and ready to vanish. That's all, Paul. False prophets claim, saying Jesus is enough. Romans 10, 12 to 13. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Jesus said, go not to anyone but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. False prophets will be turned away and cursed by Jesus. In Matthew 23, 15, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Acts 23, 6. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. Because remember, the Pharisees, as I mentioned earlier, you had these two different camps. One believes that some that there's going to be a resurrection in their lifetime, and the other one believed prophecies but didn't think it was right now. And here's here's Jesus, excuse me, in Matt, the biblical Jesus, in Matthew 23, 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And then what does Paul describe himself as in this group of people he's around again? He describes himself as a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. He's hyping up his lineage. Next, Paul displays his knowledge, but lack of understanding when he misrepresents Again, Old Testament quotes in an attempt to rationalize his concept of inherited sin. In Galatians 3, 13, Christ hath, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. 
being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, as Muslims, we know the crucifixion didn't take place. But here we have Paul saying, depending on what version of Christianity we're talking about, this is a part of God here on earth. This is the direct son of God here on earth. All of, all of that, that misguided stuff. This is supposed to be picture. This is supposed to be a part of God. Well, it's, it's hard for us to conceptualize that as Muslims, but imagine the Christians. And here Paul is saying a part of God was made a curse for us so that human beings could be forgiven. The, there is no doubting Paul's enthusiasm for whatever he believed in. But as we can see in light of the above information, readers of the Bible must ask themselves, why do so many interpret the message of Jesus through the message of Paul? This same Paul, who is unsure of his source of revelations in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 7, who admits to creating his own gospels, and this, these, these are very important. He admits to creating his own gospels in 2 Timothy 2, 8, and contradicts himself concerning his own conversion stories. From the greatest persecutor to the greatest of believers, purveyors, purveyor of the message, whose message is Paul actually purveying? Remember, Paul is his own source. In 2 Timothy 2.8, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. And as a side note for the Jew and the Muslim concerning Paul, think about this. Very important for Jews and Muslims. Galatians 5, 2 through 4. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if he be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor, debtor, to do the whole law. Alhamdulillah for Muslims and, and Islam that Allah knows we aren't perfect and he forgives us our the minor sins and he tells us he will forgive everything that he wants to forgive based on our intentions. Um, but here is Paul saying, He's equating the circumcision. He's equating it to the law. And if you follow the law, you've got to do everything or you're guaranteed hellfire. Not a very forgiving God, according to Paul, is it? Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are, justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. Remember the biblical Jesus earlier in the book, the biblical Jesus told the biblical reader that he didn't come to change the laws. He says not one jot or one tittle, meaning teeny tiny stuff, not one little bit, not one little speck will be changed from the laws until the God's laws until the end of time. And here Paul is saying that anyone that fought testifies, Paul testifies, I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Totally contradicting Jesus' message. Biblical Jesus. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. And a side note, just for us Muslims, in Galatians 4, 1 through 31, I'll jump right to verses 24 and 25. And as you can see, they've got stars by and huge here. Verses 24 and 25, which things are an allegory? That's a really cool word for Old English, right? For a comparison, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, picture this, Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar or Hagar, right? We all know who Hagar is. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. So he's equating all of this to following the laws, right? And he even mentions 
the biblical description of the mother of Ishmael, alayhi salam. Paul should have looked at Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17 before he wrote Galatians, right? Okay, now let's go to Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17 to close this out. The Old Testament tells us, let's remember who, how important Hagar and Ishmael are. We talked about them earlier, literally at the beginning of this, of all of this. Remember Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17. If a man has, and I'll shift it over to modern English, it's easier for me. If a man has two wives, one beloved and another hated, or pretend it's the first wife and the second wife, all right? Sarah and Hagar. And they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated, or the first and the second. And the firstborn son be hers that was hated, or second. Then it shall be, remember, the key here is firstborn. When he maketh his sons to inherit that which he has, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn, or the secondborn child, firstborn before the son of the hated, or the second wife, which is indeed the firstborn. No matter how you feel about wives and multiple wives, the firstborn is the firstborn. And we talked about this in a whole chapter. And then we jump to verse 17. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion. This is Deuteronomy, Old Testament, God's word through the biblical God's word through the biblical authors. He shall give him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. So think about what's taking place here when even Paul, referencing Old Testament stuff, referencing Arabia, because he knows a message is coming from Arabia. He even references Ishmael, alayhi salam, his mother, Hagar, may Allah be pleased with her. He even references her in Sinai and the Mount Sinai, um, and he references Hagar and Arabia and equating that to Jerusalem, knowing that the children of Ishmael, of Hagar, Abraham and Hagar and Ishmael down that line, we are following the law. And he compares and equates them to the people in Jerusalem that are still following the law and says, and is in bondage, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. So Paul clearly acknowledges Arabia, Agar, of course, then through that Ishmael, may Allah be pleased with both of them, and their ties to Jerusalem, and following the laws there, this, this connection all of our prophets, as we clearly acknowledge in Islam, reminding the Jews that they are literally two prophets shy of a full load. And if you took the true message of Jesus as delivered in the Quran, the Christians are only one prophet shy of a full load. But Alhamdulillah, as Muslims, we believe in all of the previous prophets, including past Abraham, right to the creation of Adam and Eve all the way through to the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And even Paul acknowledges this connection. Of course, you never hear Galatians um, 24 and 25. Well, read the whole thing. Galatians 4, 1 through 31, or just believe me, you don't have to read the Bible. But verses 24 and 25, where even Paul references our connections, Isaac, Ishmael, Arabia, um, Jerusalem, and then, of course, like I said, we go right back to the inheritance or the birthright of the firstborn. And remember, if I can close there, remember in one of Paul's conversion stories, yes, he said he didn't learn from anyone. But in one of the conversion stories, he said he never met with the disciples. He immediately went to Arabia. Think about what that says. And if you have biblical readers in your family if you if you come like i came from a, a catholic family if you come from a non-muslim family a christian family of one denomination or another if they believe and they profess all this galatian stuff and all this corinthian stuff that last quote where was i 
Um, if you go, just remember Galatians book four, because there's usually whole chapters, but Galatians chapter four, verses one through 31, particularly verses 24 and 25, where Paul equates following the law, the, belief, the people in Jerusalem, remember the disciples after Jesus, the biblical Jesus departed and Muslims after Jesus ascended to heaven alive. The Bible tells the reader that they were one of the versions. They were constantly, the disciples were constantly in the synagogue praying. Paul here in Galatians 4 tells us, tells the reader of the Bible that Hagar, Sinai, Arabia, and Jerusalem are all tied together following God's law. And he is going against it. Do we have any questions? <laughs>